Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Chapter 12. Burkett notes, Our apostle, having finished the doctrinal part of his discourse, begins here to make application of it. In the former part of his epistle, he had copiously handled the doctrinal points of faith, justification, sanctification, etc. Now, from hence to the end of the epistle, there is contained an exhortation to religious and moral duties, as an argument of their sincerity, and as an ornament to their profession. Verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Burkett notes, observe here, 1. The Apostles' loving and courteous compilation, brethren, so he calls the believing Romans. They were brethren by place and nation, and brethren by religion and profession, cemented together by the blood of Christ and by the bands of love. Observe, too, the manner of the Apostles' exhortation. It is by way of obsecration and entreaty. I beseech you, brethren. It imports great lenity and meekness. The Apostle did not want authority to command, but uses such humility as to entreat. The minister's work in office is not only to be a teacher, but a beseecher. He must not barely propound and recommend the doctrines of the gospel to his people's understanding, but must endeavor to work upon their wills and affections to embrace and entertain them. The understanding is the leading, but the will commanding faculty. Observe 3. The exhortation itself. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Present your bodies, that is, dedicate your persons, devote yourselves, your whole man, soul, and body, to the service of God and his glory. Christians are priests or a royal priesthood. They offer up themselves in sacrifice unto God as a whole burnt offering. Observe for the properties of the Christian sacrifice. It must be voluntary. Present yourselves. It must be a living sacrifice, a holy sacrifice, a reasonable sacrifice. Otherwise, it will find no acceptance with God. Observe 5. The argument or motive which the Apostle makes use of to persuade persons to present and give up themselves to God and His service, and it's drawn from the mercies of God. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God. Learn thence that the mercies of God revealed in the Gospel are the most proper, powerful, and effectual argument to persuade with and prevail upon sinners that have not given up and devoted themselves to God to do it and those that have done it, to do it more and more. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present yourselves, etc. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Burkett notes, observe here 1. The Apostles' dehortation be not conformed to this world. That is, do not fashion or accommodate yourselves to the corrupt principles and customs, to the sinful courses and practices of men of the world. The Christian is to walk singularly and not after the world's guise. He must not cut the coat of his profession according to the fashion of the times or the honor of the company he falls into. Observe, too, an apostolical exhortation. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is, be ye regenerated and changed in your whole man, beginning at the mind or understanding by which the Spirit of God worketh upon the inferior faculties of the soul. Every converted person is truly and really changed, thoroughly sanctified and renewed, endowed with new dispositions and affections. Yet this conversion and renovation is not a substantial but a qualitative change a change not in the substance of the faculties of the soul, but in the quality of those faculties. And the renewed Christian is sanctified totus, but not totiliere. He is sanctified thoroughly in all faculties, but not perfectly in all degrees. There is in a renewed man's understanding too much blindness and ignorance, in his will too great obstinacy and perverseness, in his affections too much irregularity and sensuality. Yet such is the indulgence of the gospel as to call him a holy person, a person transformed by the renewing of his mind. Observe 3. The reason of the apostle's exhortation. Be ye transformed, etc., 
that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is, that he may discern and approve what the will of God is under the gospel, which requires not what is ritually, but which is substantially good, and consequently always acceptable to him. Note here that opposition to the Levitical ceremonies and rituals and junctions. The Apostle styles the gospel institution the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And as such, may we love and embrace it and be found in the delightful practice of it. Verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, that every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Burkett notes, The Apostle having exhorted to a holy life in general, verse 1, and to a spiritual renovation of mind in order to it, verse 2, comes now to a close exhortation to more particular duties, the first of which is modesty and true humility of mind. This he recommends especially to such who bear any public office in the church and had received some peculiar or special gifts to fit and furnish them for the discharge of that office. St. Paul here particularly enjoins them, by virtue of his apostolic office, to watch against pride and haughtiness of mind, not to think themselves wiser or better than they were, but to think soberly and modestly of themselves according to truth and to the degree of faith and wisdom given unto them of God, plainly intimating that such as are exalted to a degree of eminence in the church above others are in great danger of the sin of pride, which it is their duty to watch and pray against, and to be found in the exercise of that humility and lowliness of mind which is so greatly ornamental to their persons and profession. Let not any man think of himself more highly than he ought to think but let him think soberly. Verses 4 and 5. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Burkett notes, Here the Apostle lays before us a special reason why the officers of the Church should exercise humility towards and employ their gifts and talents for the general good and benefit of the church. The argument is drawn from a comparison between the natural body and the mystical body. As in the natural body there are many members, and every member has its distinct office, the eye to see, the ear to hear, the hand to work, the foot to walk. In like manner, in the mystical body, the church of Christ, there are many members. But each member must keep his own place, and not invade the duty or usurp the office of another. But every one employ his own proper gift to the benefit and comfort of the whole, without disdaining or envying one another. Learn hence, one, that the church of Christ is one body. Two, that though the body of the church be one, and the head one, yet the members are many, united to Christ their head by faith, and to one another by love. Three, that all believers, which are members of this body, have every one his particular gift, his several function his proper office, which they are duly to exercise and perform, without encroaching upon others by proud curiosity or busy meddling. But as all the members of the body labor jointly together for the preservation of the whole, so ought all the officers and members of the church to keep their distinct stations and employ and improve regularly their several talents for the mutual edification and benefit of each other, without encroachment or intruding upon the offices of each other. God is a God of order, and hates disorder in his church. Verses 6 through 8. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence. He that show mercy with cheerfulness. Burkett notes, As if our apostle had said, Seeing it has pleased God to appoint distinct officers in his church and to furnish those officers with various degrees of gifts and not to make all equal, either in gift or office, let everyone in general faithfully execute his office and keep within the limits of his calling, neither neglecting his own duty nor invading another. 
In particular, let him that prophesieth, that is, expoundeth the scriptures in the church, do it according to the portion of faith, or according to what is taught plainly and uniformly in the whole scripture of the Old and New Testament as the rule of our faith. We must not rack or rest the scripture to make them speak what we please, but what the prophets and apostles taught, whom we interpret. Otherwise we do not expound according to the analogy and proportion of faith. Let him that ministereth, teacheth, or exhorteth, attend upon that work with all diligence, and he that performs the office of a deacon, who are called helps, 1 Corinthians 12.28, and is employed to relieve the poor out of the church's stock, and to take care of strangers, orphans, aged, sick, and impotent persons. Let him do it with simplicity, that is, without partiality in respect of persons, and with cheerfulness, that is, with alacrity of heart, with gentleness in words, with pleasantness of countenance, bearing the infirmities of the aged, with the loathsomeness of the sick and diseased, and administering with delight to the necessities of all that want. Now from the whole note one, that God of his free bounty has beautified his church with diverse officers and gifts. Note two, that those whom God has bestowed ministerial gifts upon ought humbly and faithfully to improve them to the church's benefit and education. 